Blood Brothers Podcast, a Five Pillars Production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there. And welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Didi Hussain. Before I introduce today's very special guest, I remind all the avid podcast listeners to subscribe to our Five Pillars YouTube channel, and you can find this show on all the major audio platforms. Today's guest is someone who I am meeting for the first time. He's someone whose work we have shared on Five Pillars and whose work I have personally benefited from. He's a brother who specializes in Islamic finance and all things related to to that area. And that is none other than my dear brother, Ibrahim Khan, from the Islamic Finance Guru blog, YouTube channel, and all the other platforms which you exist in. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Was that intro good enough? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So it's I've, I- I've definitely had worse. Okay. So it's IFG, do you pride itself in the blog aspect or that fact you've got a very growing YouTube channel now? I, I think, um, I don't know about pride but like the the thing i take satisfaction from is that honestly like i think on the friday calls when you know you just random people book in mm. and you can just help a person and you can see them unlock you're like oh okay this makes sense oh you, you know this has been really helpful from a personal perspective that's really helpful um or like that's something i take a lot of you know pleasure from Alhamdulillah. But yeah but is that like you know is that the reason that you know we do IFG? I guess not. I think I guess it's about trying to take that moment and trying to scale it. Did um, I, but IFG started as a blog? Yeah, uh, so we started back in 2015, uh, where me and my co-founder Mohsin, my mm-hmm. my friend as well, uh, we were like, okay, so we're doing. Uh, I was doing some studying at the time. I was doing my Alim course, and I'd just come off my masters, and we were kind of thinking, all right, well, we're doing this research anyway because we're into money from the start and researching. And we thought, okay, we're doing all of these notes. Why don't we just put it on the internet? And, you know, other people can benefit from it. And uh, and they seemed to a little bit, you know, my mum and you know, all the family members that we sent it to. And then it kind of start, started from there. So tell me a bit, so so you did a BA? Yeah. What did you do that in? Uh, so I did it in uh, philosophy, politics and economics. Wow. And uh, okay. the thinking behind that, um, so I, I did it at Oxford, and the thinking behind that Come was... Uh, <laughs> Love it. Uh, that, I think that's the best response I've ever had. Yeah, uh, why not? Why, why, why can we not champion Muslims and people of colour who go into these... Uh, Damn right. Uh, Damn these right. Damn right. And you know, this is actually the reason why I did it. Because, yeah. so I was, my mum was like very, you know, Jamaat Islami kind okay. of background. And she was like, okay, you need to kind of try and help the Muslim community. Alhamdulillah. And so I read this book as a 17 year old called Who Runs This Place? Okay. Uh, by some author, I think some, some guy called Samson or something, journalist. Okay. And in this book I was reading and every single chapter, like, you know, the civil service, politics, academia, uh, fine, everything, it, it actually made the point that PPE is this new degree that all of these guys seem to have seem to have done. David Cameron, yep. you know, like all of these guys. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Um, and Muslims don't seem to figure too much in this. So I was like, okay, let's let's go for this then, you know, uh, and make sure that Muslims are represented. And then when I applied, I applied for Bracenos College. Which is very in line with the Maududi model, Rahimahullah. I mean, he, his, his vision uh, was that Muslims, before the society becomes Islamic, or, be, or before a state becomes Islamic, or that the, the Muslims would want such a state, you first have to go into these very key positions and try to influence them as much as possible from an Islamic uh, point of view. So I think you're on, on point with the PPE point of view, Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I mean, I probably wasn't as... You know, sophisticated as that yeah. at that time, I was like, you know, okay, he said it. You know, <laughs> David Cameron's at this college, let's do it, yeah. uh, and it happened. And alhamdulillah, it happened. After uh, the BA, what did you do? Uh, I did a masters in Islamic banking and finance. I was actually taking the year out to start my Alim course. Okay, and then it was, you know, it was an evening cl- class, and I had it all day, so I figured, all right, let me do something else. And the masters fitted in quite nicely. Uh, so I, I didn't did know you had this. Uh, I'm I'm so sorry. It's it's not that I meant to judge a book by its cover, <laughs> because by the book cover, you seem like a uh, practicing brother. But I yeah. didn't know that you had uh, a, a dini ilmi background. So where, so where did you do this alim course? Where did you start that? Um, so I I started it. I mean, I guess I'd been studying on and off. I mean, we mentioned before that I'd been studying in Egypt, Egypt as yes. well. Um, so I did my uh, ijaza and hifl and that sort of thing from from there. And um, 
and then my again it was about this you know my thinking after university was i want to go into islamic finance but i don't want to do it just from like a conventional perspective i want to have that islamic aspect because you know it's only when you combine the two that it gets interesting um and so and my mum was again and my mum and dad were both really keen for me to do my alim course uh so so i started that may allah bless them um, man i yeah, mean may allah bless them I mean, that's, that's that's really i mean that's really beautiful that a son who went to oxford bro if, if someone's son or daughter went to Oxford or Cambridge, you know everyone in the hood is hearing about that. <laughs> everyone in the whole town is going to know about my putter who went to Oxford. You know that. So the fact that you did that and your parents, mashallah, were still supportive and encouraging and wanted you to do, pursue your religious uh, knowledge, alhamdulillah, that's, that's beautiful, man. Yeah, no, uh, you know, uh, may Allah put barakah and everything. I mean, you um, So yeah, I... Uh, I did. I started with Sheikh Radul Haq's place okay. in Leicester, cool. and then uh, I got uh, married and moved to Manchester. So then I started with As Salam Institute, okay, cool. and continued that. Uh, then I finished with As Salam, and uh, and then we've been. I've been doing some, uh, you know, some private work uh, with some scholars in Egypt, uh, and also Mufti Faraz. Yes, we've got this two-year, very detailed course that we do every Friday. Uh, There's about fifty, hundred people on there now. Um, where we just go through this uh, Islamic finance textbook um, that was written by the Ottomans uh, back in the day called the Majalla. And it's uh, important, I guess, it's just on the point of the Ottomans because they would be the closest and perhaps the most coherent in terms of documentation historically of what an Islamic economic system would look like. Exactly, yeah. Because you can't, look, you can't look at Abbasid policies or exactly. Mayid policies or Ghaznavid policies or Seljuk. You'll find Ottoman policies, right? Exactly. So that's why we're studying it. It's because it's it's the practical... Like it's something that's been actually implemented. 100%. So it's very pragmatic. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's been a journey. And to be honest, uh, it's going to continue. It's something that I enjoy. Bro, you vowed me, man. Yeah. Shall I tell you something? Shall I tell you who batted for your side from day? Roshan did. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. From day he goes, listen, brother. Because remember, you used to be Ibrahim. Yes, we can. Uh, I still am on Gmail. Uh, are you? <laughs> so, and then I always remember you as Ibrahim. Yes, we can. And you know, I only realized that the yes, we can be was a play on. I thought your name was Yes Juan or something. Oh, this this has happened before. So I, I I've done talks. Where I thought you were Yes Juan. I know. People have introduced me as brother Yeshwi Khan. Yeshwi Khan, I thought, and, and then Roshan wants to be because no, it's yes we can, Dili. And you know, mashallah, in the earlier articles and the blogs, we did share them. And I remember, Sabal, I'm, I'm so confident in saying this to you because I've met you and it's only been about 10 minutes. Do you know what one of the things I said to him? What was it? I said, does Buffett Ibrahim have ilmi background? Because for someone to be saying something is questionable or halal or haram, yeah. I goes, you know, the brother needs to have some kind of ilmi background. Roshan, does he have ilmi background? I goes, because if you're putting stuff up on the website, yeah. right, you best be, but there you go. Pleasantly Alhamdulillah. surprised. Alhamdulillah, my bro. Yeah, we don't, I don't like really shout about it. Um, but it does need to be said sometimes, bro, because yeah. if someone's going to take what you're saying seriously, them credentials matter, bro. 100%. I mean, it's on the website. Mm. But like from, I guess, the probably the reason why you've never heard of it is from a brand perspective. You know, I we or me don't really hold ourselves out as scholars. So I'm not like Ustad Ibrahim or mm. Sheikh Ibrahim Khan. I, I, I want us to be able to relate to people. So brother Yeshwi uh, Khai is okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So look, I want to ask you a few things, right? Um, because there's a massive hype and has been for the good three, four, five years, three, four, five, yeah, three, four, five years on Instagram, you know, brothers and sisters promoting uh, certain types of hustles and, you know, different types of making money, you know, other than conventional nine to five work. I want to just go through some of these uh, areas and get your thoughts on it from an Islamic point of view, because I know you've written about it. I know you've done videos on it. And then towards the end of the podcast, because whilst we are filming before Ramadan, inshallah, I hope this episode to be out in Ramadan. And I know there's a lot to be said about the Muslim charity sector, which we'll get to towards the end of the podcast. But let me just ask you a few things, a yeah. few industries, a few hustles, yeah. which I know many Muslims are involved in. And I want to get your thoughts on it. Let's start with Forex. Let's do it. What is Forex? So Forex, it, it's it's a in in the word it's foreign exchange, right? Um, and there's two kinds when you when you say foreign exchange. There's the travel X or the post office down the street. There's no problem with that. All you're doing is you're exchanging money, you know, one for one. That's it. 
Then there's Forex, and this is the Forex that we're talking about. So let me just stop you there. So if I was to now buy a thousand pounds worth of Bangladeshi tucker, mm. right, with the intention that once the economy drops or the price of the pound goes yeah, up yeah, or yeah. high, that I can make a quick hustle, yeah. is that allowed? That's perfectly fine because you've done it um, hand to hand and you've done it on spot. And crucially, very crucially, you've done it without any leverage. So what that means is that let's say uh, the Bangladeshi taka is worth 100 and there's one pound. If you spend one pound, you will get exposure to 100 taka. That's it. You're not using any kind of leverage where with one pound, you can actually buy a thousand pounds worth of Bangladeshi taka. Um, and you get, you know, 10,000 pounds worth of, t uh, or 10,000 taka as, as a result with just a little bit of money. And what you suggest in that Forex does that? Forex does that, yeah. That's why it makes it interesting. Because otherwise, you know, the, the movement of, the, of the, the rates, the currency exchange rates, is tiny every single day. It's, you know, very, very small amounts. But the reason why people uh, can trade that or potentially make money on that to a large amount is because um, uh, is because you have this leverage aspect. It's so, leverage. so so what it means is that if you um, it's like you know when you buy a house right yes. if you, with a conventional mortgage let's say um, with with just a deposit of twenty percent you can get exposure to let's say a hundred thousand pound house so with twenty thousand down you get a hundred thousand total got you and that doubles now to two hundred thousand pounds. You get a profit of a hundred thousand on top of that. Boom. So, so look, 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 I'm all about simpleton terms, yeah? So what you're saying is leverage, and I love the analogy you gave to the house. So I've put a twenty percent I put a ten percent deposit down yeah. to a two hundred grand house, which makes it twenty, 20 grand. Yeah. Now if that value of that house goes up, I've profited X amount, whatever that profit is. Is that yeah. what you're talking is the leverage is? Exactly. Okay. So, the, so the leverage aspect is with that £20,000, mm. let's say that £200,000 house goes up by, I don't know, £100,000. With that £20,000, you have had a 5x return. Now, What's it, wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Um, because there's actual, you know, real assets involved and, you know, that you're taking a, your stake with, with the bank and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, if we assume it's an Islamic mortgage. Mm. Um, what's happening here is that the way that the leverage is created, mm. there isn't an Islamic aspect to it. It's mm. just a straight up loan. Um, and without going into like, you know, really complicated details, um, let's say you've got FXCM or one of the big, you know, Forex brokers. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, they are, um, they are either lending you that money or another way of un understanding it is that this money is just kind of a figment of everyone's imagination. It's a derivative. It's just this thing that's created to allow this gambling to happen. So, you know, with gambling, you know, you can leverage up and things like that as well. But you, can, all, but you can also cash out, though. What do, you, what do you mean? Like, you know, you said that, that this money is just a figment. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is, when you're up, you can cash out. So, you, it, so it is real. You sure. can, but the reason why you get that amount of money is because of the leverage. So let's okay. say, so FXCM won't let you trade just £100 to buy $100 because it's, you know, you're just not going to get anywhere. You might make a dollar, you know, in, you know, a, a few days. Like it's not going to make they'll a make difference. They'll make you buy an um, obscure high risk currency. No, no, they'll, they, they'll make you buy a dollar. Okay. But because you've got leverage on it, that hundred pounds that you're putting in will allow you to access, let's say, ten thousand dollars. Got you. And then a little bit of movement on that allows you to make, let's say, twenty, thirty, fifty dollars per day. And compared to the hundred pounds you put in, that's like, you know, that's pretty decent. That is. Um, but the problem is the way that all this happens, it's not real. So what's the haram element? What? what, what because I'm assuming that's where it's heading towards, yeah. right? What is what makes yeah. forex impermissible from a shadowy point of view? Very good question. Um, so I think the it, it depends on how the different forex broker structure. But in a nutshell, it's either uh, buying and selling something that you don't actually own, okay? Uh, because it's a derivative. It's some kind of piece of paper that is saying I'm buying and selling a currency pair. But in actual reality, no one's actually taking ownership over any of the money. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it could be seen as a derivative. And a derivative is just the IOU. Um, so it, it doesn't exist. So you can't, wow. you know, and then the third thing is that there's this interest component. So, you know, you could either, uh, you, could, you could see it as an interest bearing loan. Mm -hmm. But if it's an interest bearing loan, and it's an interest free loan, by the way, it's a Qard Hassan, mm -hmm. but... 
the broker is the one making you that loan and the broker is taking their fees. So whenever you have an interest-bearing loan tied to another um, fee that, that is associated with it always, that is just you know interest by the back door. Does that make sense? Makes absolute sense. Stocks. Stocks allowed. Yeah, Tes- go for it. Tesla, uh, Apple. Yeah, good question. So uh, with stocks and shares, ultimately what you're doing is you're buying and selling um, a uh, a stake in a company. Like yep. it really simply, that's what you're doing. So what uh, what makes it haram or halal? is the company that you're buying that stake in. Yep. Um, and the way that scholars understand it, they say, okay, you need to analyze it from two perspectives. One is the qualitative side, and the other one is the quantitative side. So qualitatively, is uh, you know Diageo, this big alcohol manufacturer, halal? No, it's not, because it's just doing something obviously haram. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the quantitative side is how much debt does it have, and how much haram income does it make? Because... Pretty much every big conglomerate these days has a portion of haram income going on. So it could be like minute amount of, you know, just interest on the bank account. Um, or it could be more substantial, let's say, you know. Uh, but it's usually interest, app- isn't it? It's interest or it could be haram income. So like Apple, for example, with their Apple TV stuff going on, you know, is that is that halal income? You know, it's questionable. Mm-hmm. Or Amazon with its Amazon Prime, is that halal or haram? Again, it's questionable. Um, so if you have uh, on the quantitative side, if you've got too much haram income coming in, that's a problem. Um, and if you've got too much debt, again, that becomes a problem. How are you ever supposed to ascertain that though? How are you ever supposed to know how much haram income Apple has or Tesla has or how? It's, I, I honestly think it's, it's, a, it's a very good question uh, because most of these companies don't really tell you okay. because they don't care, right? In their okay. annual res- reports, they do not care about what's haram, uh, what's haram and, and halal. What's interest, yeah. So there, there are two views to that. One is that you, know, you just essentially take a bit of an approximation okay. um, and, you, you know, and you kind of finger in the air job. Okay. And then the other view, and I think this is, the, I guess, the sensible view here, is that you know, if you... If you're looking at a company like, let's say, an Apple or a Netflix, where you, you're pretty confident that this is not, you know, this is not marginal stuff. This is the major part of what they do, and a bunch of that will be haram. Let's say Netflix. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Okay. Um, so where the haram aspect of forex was to do with the leverage, as well as the interest component, as well as the fact that a lot of this stuff. Is IOUs and figments and nothing that's tangible and actually exists. Can I can I add something on forex? Go, go for it. Go, go. So on for so I uh, in my previous life I was a corporate lawyer. Come on. And um, I used to work in uh, in like the regulation department where all of the forex brokers, this yeah. particular law firm that I worked at, yeah. would use them. Okay. So you saw from the inside what they were doing. What these scumbags were yeah. up to, uh, and they now have to carry a warning that they didn't have to carry before, but we knew it, yeah. uh, which was that 80% of people who actually use Forex mm-hmm. will make a loss. And who do you think is on the other side of those transactions? If you're a Forex company, yeah. you know 80% of people are going to make a loss. Yeah. You're happy to take that other side of the, the, of the exchange all day long. 100%. And so in my view, really quite frankly, is you know quite aside from the haram or halal of it, it's, it really is equivalent to gambling in my view. Okay. Unless you are extremely experienced and you're properly dedicated and you're one of those that kind of like physics graduates who are into their maths and everything, um, you're going you're gonna to lose money. Do you know such Muslim people that are that serious about Forex as well as being superly God-fearing with regards to the halal and haram aspects of it? Well, no, because you, you can't. You can't even, so that commercially... <laughs> So commercially, you, yeah. like that physics graduate could make money. Yeah. But if he's practicing, he wouldn't be doing it. Okay. Hey. Um, whereas you're saying that stocks and shares has a has more room for potentially safely investing if if the the, the debt aspect, the haram aspect. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And there's lots of like you know there's halal funds out there. There's halal uh, companies out there. You know people like uh, Wahid Invest. Sarwa, Pension B, Aghaz, Zoya, there's lots of them out there. Um, and they've got Islamic scholars who you know, screen their stocks and their investments. So you can get exposure to all of this stuff. But it's through a dead filter. returns, man. That is very true. Come on, like, who are you going to invest in Wahid or say, Omar's going to kill me when I love you to bits, man. But I'm just saying that the returns are slow and dead, isn't it? 
that's what the shabab that's what they're going to think in they're like come on man you want uh, me to put 1000 pounds in and then what get 1200 pounds back after a year come on i mean i i uh, sympathize with you on okay. that okay um let me take a step back but, but you're just saying that's how the real world is i guess no no i'm not so i let me take a step back so the um the reason why i do ifg yeah. is because i want to make muslims wealthier and that's you know that's because muslims half of <laughs> <laughs> half of Muslims are in the 10% poorest areas in the UK. Yeah. Globally, they you know there's 25% of us in the world, but 8% of net wealth is owned by us. So there's a massive shortfall. Yeah, but there's now, sociopolitical and historical reasons to that reality course, as well. Of course. Of course. But the but now the game is how can we as Muslims catch up with the rest of the world? And very candidly speaking, the way that you do that is you go for things that are going to give give you more return. than the average investor is going to make as a muslim community as a whole mm. and also entrepreneurship you know those are the two roots um and so this is why not I, the not the islamic caliphate <laughs> well pass <laughs> <laughs> that was god and you were saying so you want to make muslims rich and the only way or, or one of the best ways you think see that is happening is through entrepreneurship and what was the other thing that you said and, and through and through investments that make higher returns of course um now having said that those kind of investments are also high risk and our same muslim community who say these returns are dead they're the same community who will put 100% on you know bankor or like you know uh, doge coin or something mm. and then get upset when it you know goes to like 50% or 30% and that was their deposit for the house so so what you're basically saying to, to, to me and my instagram followers is basically you moan about low returns the halal way but you screw about the big losses with the high risk elements exactly but i'm also saying to the <sighs> same same people that mm. there's a way to have exposure to that high risk stuff mm. and and frankly i think there should be a decent element of that high risk stuff in a portfolio i mean the way that do you, you invest know, in stuff Yeah. We invested at the moment. Stocks, crypto, um uh startups is okay. a, is a big one. Okay. So what what um, stocks are you into? Do you want to recommend some? Or you not allowed to say? I don't know. I don't I, know. I don't know what. about recommendations, but um Okay, disclaimer. Uh, anything that Ibrahim says and you guys do it and you're broke in the in the weeks of months to come, fault. it's not his fault, it's no one's fault. You definitely is suing us. Carry on. <laughs> Fantastic. Um so I I like um to invest in really long term stuff technology okay. related okay. because i feel like that's where the future is at mm. um and so my stock stuff is really just my pension money my okay. like my self invested pension okay. so i'm investing in things like i don't know digital ocean or crowd strike okay. okay. cyber like really boring infrastructure cyber security stuff like essentially what i look at is where what our software engineering team what are the things that they're making me sign up subscriptions to yeah. uh because they're just essential things and yeah. i just invest in those companies okay um so it's it's a decent strategy um cool. i mean it's it's just starting out so let's see how it goes no netflix uh, not apple no tesla no none, none of that none okay. of that at the moment okay cool um and then and then the other side is crypto okay. uh, and so i invested lots of crypto um but uh, but particularly we like you know hbar bitcoin ethereum so boom There's that's a, that's um, our next one crypto so I'm an avid crypto trader. Nice. I, I love Bitcoin. Uh jumped onto it when the whole hype happened in 2017. Nice. Uh got onto it. Why are you still here then? Huh? <laughs> Because I made some bad calls and I just I just felt that there was an element of shorting because I went for a period where I was shorting Bitcoin with large amounts of money. I see. And it did feel like gambling. Mm. Um I had I dabbled with alts for a little period and it definitely felt like mm. gambling. As but or maybe the way I approached it. I used to um I should basically skim, right? I should put in a lot mm. of money. Uh you should get a lot of um uh, satoshis and then whenever it goes up, just pull it out and it, it just felt like yeah, it didn't yeah, feel yeah. right. Yeah. I had some losses. I hate Verge, I hate Tron. Yeah. All you mom some bad memories, you know that. <laughs> But Bitcoin is king. and i still trade in bitcoin i still when it, when it, when it comes down to average it out i'll buy yeah 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 so bitcoin cool i i like bitcoin um i like i have this like really big thesis on web 3.0 met the metaverse crypto okay. blockchain Go i on, feel like us. this is the future that's the future um, yeah because you know again it comes back to this thesis about the muslim ummah and like trying to get to that next level the the way that you do what south korea and israel and germany and you know the san, Fran- san francisco all of these places did third world countries many of them 
that are now the leading countries in the world from a tech perspective. Would um, India be one of those countries? Yeah, um, they're getting there. They're not there yet, but they're getting there. How far is Pakistan, Bangladesh? They're a bit further behind. Why? But they're getting there. Why? Slowly. Um, because I don't think they've uh, they've perhaps had as much money yet okay. invested in them. And, as yeah. opposed to, in comparison to India? In comparison to India. Got you. Um, and China is obviously massive. So what all of these countries had in common is it latched onto a big trend. That's the thing that you want to like, the big technological shift that is not only going to go massive, it's going to make possible a way of the world that didn't ex- exist before. So social media is a product of the internet. It didn't, couldn't happen before. Digital ocean, this thing that I'm investing in, mm-hmm. is not a thing that would be, you know, it's not... A th- it's crypto not- wouldn't be possible without the internet. Exactly. So crypto and blockchain and the metaverse and Web 3.0 are now the, the the second or the third wave of the internet. Okay. So this is where, you know, the first wave of the internet was where you could read the internet. The, 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 the second wave was where you could write on it as well. You could enter things Post and interact. It, publish it, yeah. interact, yep. And then the third is where you can own it as well. So instead of going for this kind of, you know, walled garden of centralization, Facebook and Google and Amazon, all of these guys, now you're moving into this world where it's all decentralized and everyone owns a little piece of everything. And you can see the first kernels of that in like these games Mm -hmm. where no one really owns the game, but everyone can kind of make some money from a game. And, And the way I see the future going is that you've got, you know, I, I think this is the end of the nation state potentially in the next few decades. Um, Love that because you know with the, with the nation bring back the empires. <laughs> Go on. I'm not sure about the empires, but like what what I think is going to happen is you know people we've got this re- this really um, uh, this really uh, dichotomous uh, political you know situation where there are like let, let's say Trump right you have 50 percent of America that hates each other. Um, and that is not going to last. You know, that's not something that is sustainable. Of course not. And so people are now finding their own communities online because you can do that for the first time in a really deep way with the metaverse and everything. So what happens next is that these people then start, you know, so goes this thesis, start actually congregating geographically, physically in locations as well. And the all of the rails, the payment rails, are now controlled by crypto, which is decentralized. So governments... Tell uh, us what you mean by decentralized. I mean, I, mean, I know what it means, yeah, yeah, yeah. but for our viewers and listeners who have a very rudimentary or little to none understand, when they hear, oh, this is decentralized. What does that de- mean? What does that mean? What it basically means is like the Quran, right? Okay. With Hufaz that have the Quran in their heart all over the world. If you destroy all of the copies in the Quran, the Quran could be replicated very of quickly. Course. That is decentralized, um, whereas... So what would a centralized version of the Qur'an be? Just for an argument's sake. If so if people didn't have that memorized, then there would be like some authoritative copy somewhere. Um, and that's, you know, who owned that would have ultimate power. And they would then be able to copy that and distribute it. And they would have sovereign, like, and they would be the authority. So, uh, on so this. Roman Catholicism in the Vatican. Possibly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So, so, so decentralized in a crypto point of view means What? So in in the crypto point of view is, you know, with payments, the Bank of England and the governments are the ones who control and give authority to the the value of a pound. Okay. But in crypto, that same thing happens because uh, through decentralized ledgers, these essentially these lists of things that are that that write down exactly all the different transactions that happen. In other words, you don't need a central authority to be able to, you know, facilitate payment. Two questions. Um, one pertaining to um, uh, a dear teacher and murabbi of mine, Sheikh Haytham al-Haddad, Hafidahullah, I mean. Um, and other scholars have also cited that the very fact that crypto isn't backed by states and authorities and recognised institutions is what can potentially make it Impermissible. Some have said that is what makes it impermissible. Others have said that's at least where the doubt would come. Yeah. What would your response be to that? So, um, with uh, with crypto, the first is: is it even a currency or a digital asset? In my view, I, I see think, it as a digital asset. Yeah, I see it as a digital asset yeah. as well. So that's the first thing. So the analysis almost for currency, you know, kind of goes away. Um, but the second thing is, you know, with currency, ultimately. You know what gives currency um, its currenciness? It's that it's a store of value. Um, it gold, has, gold reserves. 
Uh, they claim it's at least to do with reserves, no? It's not anymore. It's okay. not been for decades now. Really? Yeah, so the only reason why the pound has the value it does is because you, the government says it has value and we all kind of accept it. It's literally just... You know when you have those pump and dump schemes on crypto? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually what the government is doing really as well. Fine, quickly but then. But it's just institutionalised pump and dump. Fair enough. Now, if if the British government and the Bank of England, they mm. essentially dictate what the worth of the GBP is, mm. how then you how then do we now compete the GBP, GBP to the dollar or the yen? Who decides that then? Well, that's, that's demand and supply, right? That's just the okay. market. But in terms of... Um, the, the government doesn't set the value of the pound. What it does is, let's say it has levers on the inflation rate by setting the inter interest rate and it has the power to print money yeah. those are the two things it has to influence how how much demand and supply there is of of the of the uh, gbp um but but crucially the government it also has this sovereign authority as a military might to say that in this land this G what the gbp is what goes okay and that's really crucial because that obviously gives it a lot of authority. But don't they have um, the authority as the state, as the yeah, government? Yeah, of course. Okay. Of course. Now, now the the now the question is, do cryptocurrencies have that? And and to my view, it really is an evolving landscape. Um, I think in a lot of places, actually, things like Bitcoin are maybe not a year ago, maybe not two years ago when um, I know Sheikh Haytham and others mm. started thinking about this. But now I think it's getting to the point where hmm, maybe it's at the point where you could say this is a, a way, a legitimate way of making payments. Like Ukraine, mm. it's it's actually being actually used. Yeah, it's, it's being used now. Um, and my uh, my concern, I think Mufti Faraz had an interesting thought about this about a year and a half ago about having a kind of like uh, a sandbox mm. for fiqhi ideas. Because my Candidly speaking, my concern with modern technologies is that they, you know, crypto requires almost software engineering levels of understanding to really get into the, you know, the the, the proper deep, you know, minutiae of it. Mm. But if that's the case, then an Islamic scholar typically is not, you know, uh, equipped to deal with it. Yeah. And that's not their fault. Um, but then what happens is that, you know, and this is our failing as a community, we don't invest in it enough. Can they not take basic principles from the Sharia and then apply it to these things? Which is what some scholars would do. So they do, yeah. Whether something has tangible value or not, whether you can touch it and actually exchange yeah. it with your hands. There you are know, certain principles. Can they not take those well-established normative principles and then apply it to Forex, crypto, stocks, shares? Or, or is that problematic? No, you, you definitely can do that. But... The issue is that if you have, um, if, if as a scholar, you, you're you not deep within that space, uh, I don't, like, you sound like you're, you know, you're into crypto, so you're quite, you yeah. look at white papers and you're into <laughs> yes, that of course, kind of stuff. You have to. So, you know, let's say you in 2016, where you're kind of coming in cold, you've read a few articles and you kind of know exactly what's going on, but you now, 2022, Dilly, I'm completely different. It's just, you, you know Which it up, you yeah. know, deeply. It's innate within you. It's like a GP, like an experienced GP. Mm. Within a few questions, he can just tell you the answer. And, you know, someone who's an inexperienced GP will look at the books and like kind of figure it all out and then give you an answer, but it's not as reliable. Um, I think that's the difference. Okay. And and my, and my so the concern I have um, with uh, with the way modern technology is it moves so fast. Three, six, nine, ever 12 evolving, months. Ever evolving, ever changing. And you, and you said that the scholars need to be up to date with those changes I, I don't know what I'm saying I don't know if I'm saying that I'm saying that the, the problem here's the problem the problem is that if you know the sco the same scholars who back in the day said um, you know microphones were haram should not be used in the masjid mm. if, the, if those if that same approach is taken here then by the time it becomes permissible yeah, yeah. you've lost a decade I've got you and and by that time forget web 3.0 there's like web 5.0 going on and, and that's haram at that point. And then 10 years later, Muslims are finally allowed to get Web 5.0. You're basically saying that we're, we're some of a step behind if we keep doing that. Yeah. But then I know what the, you know, the, the scholars that I've spoken to about this, they would say, well, look, you have to be cautious. You can't just accept everything and say it's halal. Um, and, and there needs to be a process. I think the solution is probably some kind of really big investment in scholarship so that we're actually on par to be able to make those decisions. Have you had those um, conversations with Mufti Faraz and other ulama? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what has their general feelings been with regards to such a project or such an, such an investment where we have scholars 
men of religious knowledge and of the sacred sciences that are also well versed and understanding and following the ever changing uh, digital technologies and stuff like crypto. Has it been positive? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I mean, who wouldn't? Um, ex- you know, which scholars wouldn't accept a scholarship fund? Um, it's. I think it's hundred percent a good thing. I mean, we're we're thinking about perhaps you know the next version of the course that we do with Mufti Faraz. Mm. Um, a portioning like a percentage of the revenues from that what is the current course that you're doing uh, so it's, it's a course it's a majalla course okay. it's like an advanced islamic finance uh weekly course that we've been running for two years where can where can um, where can our viewers and listeners find this course if they want to take part in it courses.islamicfinanceguru.com okay. okay but it's it's coming to the end now in the next few months but there's a new version of it which is like a hadith focused one okay inshallah. um and, and and the thinking is that you know perhaps we put a portion of the revenues there to scholars mm. uh, and and actually give some of them free access to this course as well Shandam. because you know I mean this is a tiny this is not the solution this is a tiny contribution it's a to contribution what, yeah bro. to the wider solution I think there needs to be lots of money put into this um, and then I think also really frankly scholars need to be um, a bit more agile on like moving fast on this stuff like this is not this is not just a fiqh question this is a question about the Muslim Ummah's future. That, that's what it's go- that's what's going on because if you th- and this is you know this is a war right mm. we don't fight wars anymore physically as much economic wars we wa- fight wars Digital economically wars. digitally and using technology this is the battlefield and if you're saying to muslims do not engage in that battle um disabling us that's, for some reason? that's you know and I'm, I'm not like saying what what the right or wrong of it is but what i'm saying is if you consistently do that the outcome is very clear um, and, and also, by the way, Muslims, you know, the average Muslim laity do not care. They're going into crypto anyway. Um, and, you know, uh, so there's, there's as- that aspect to it as well. Just on the last one before we move on to my next uh, area of discussion. So what about sharks then? Sharks who possess huge amounts of Bitcoin and huge amounts of other alts. But let's just talk about Bitcoin and Ethereum and the, kind of the major crypto. What they have a role in manipulating the price. They have a role in when they buy and they sell. Yeah. That they manipulate the, the 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 value of a bitcoin or the value of an Ethereum. Isn't that a grey area or, 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 or an area which Islam would have something to say about it in terms of its impermissibility? Yeah, hundred percent. So saying that in principle, an asset is um, pr- permissible mm. is not to say that everything within the asset or the different practices would be permissible. So it's the same as stocks, right? If you have um, people manipulating price in stocks or any any asset Does class. it make the stock itself in and of itself? Yeah, in its exactly. Asal haram. exactly. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Cool. My next topic, um, a personal favourite, because again, it's a lived experience, Islamic mortgage. So yeah. let me tell you my situation. Uh, purchased my property via Al Rayyan in 2017 during their uh, home purchase plan. Uh, when they were doing 10%. And um, I kind of understood uh, the, um, the the Sharia explanation, the, the Sharia permissibility, the basis for it. Is it Musharaka? Yeah. Yeah, where you like shared ownership, right? Yeah. And, and it's basically, as I understood it, it's this, yes? They are here, I am here, I eventually get there, it gets handed over to me, I pay them rent. That's it. Is that it? Bro, it felt like being... Renting a yard out from a drug kingpin, bro. <laughs> How am I paying thirteen hundred pounds, and next man's paying six hundred and eighty pounds? How does that work, bro? And then I genuinely, I need to know that. Uh, very good question. Because uh, I didn't feel halal, bro. <laughs> if if if, if, if like some donnies had me at a revolver gunshot thingy blah blah, like how am I paying twelve eighty? Yeah, and then next brother is paying six hundred six hundred fifty pound. Yeah. He's saying he's following the Hanafi ruling of, on one property in Darul Harb and Haram contracts, and he's allowed one property. And I, how? <laughs> how man? And I'm a staunch Hanafi myself. Yeah, and here I am paying thirteen hundred pounds. Yeah. So, uh, and then I, and then I get my end of year statement, and I'm like, yo. Is that how much I've actually paid in terms of the actual acquisition? Yeah. But they hurt, bro. It still hurts me now. <laughs> Can you please explain to us 
Can you please explain to her how that's halal, bro? Uh, that is um, probably the most. Not, not, not disrespect to Al Rayyan, yeah. by the way. Mashallah, yeah. your customer service is well, okay, but but nevertheless, I'm just saying that it was a shock. It was a shock to no, but my yeah. whole family invested in you guys. My sister, yeah. my sister, may Allah bless her. She was the first one that said, "Look, go to Al Rayyan," and this was before Amana was finished at HSBC. Yeah, yeah. I went to Al Rayyan, bro. It, it didn't feel right, man. It didn't feel right. So there, there's there's a few different things. The first okay. is like, why is it more expensive? Okay, let, no, no, the, okay, okay. Let's address the Musharaka condo. Is, is, yeah. Yeah, what is this model? It, in a nutshell, you know, if it's let's say let's forget the bank. Let's say let's it's use a, your can we, dad. Can we, can we use a car as an example? Yeah, if you want. Okay. Yeah. Let's say you. My dad in a car. Yeah. Your you. There's a twenty thousand pound car. You say, look, I'm going to put four thousand in. That's all I have. Dad, dad can you give me sixteen. Yeah. Put in sixteen. Yeah. And I'll rent that portion from you. I'll pay you a hundred quid every month. Um. And and I'll also pay you a thousand back every month as well. Bro, you're um, going on like I'm setting the terms to my dad. My dad's setting those terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's setting some big terms there, bro. Yeah, yeah. He's saying you want that M3 putter for twenty grand. <laughs> Guess what? I want that, and I want more than double back. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's say your dad does that. Okay, so let's say your dad does that. I'll write under that to me. And then on. eventually, yeah. eventually, you pay your dad back. Yeah. Um, that twenty, let's say twenty five thousand yeah. or thirty thousand. Yeah. Plus, um, well, so, so you plus would pay, the rent. Sorry, yeah. no, you would pay your dad back that twenty thousand and plus and rent. Then rent of ten thousand on top of that. Okay. Why um, is that rent so high? Very good question. So this is where it comes into like, where are they getting this money from? Okay. So the way a bank makes money. Is they uh, they have deposits they 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 take in money from various sources and then they lend that out to various people and they make an interest bearing return on it right this is a conventional bank that's how they work. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I know this is a really silly childish question. What if every single person decides to take their money out on the same day? Yeah. What happens? The entire economy collapses. So 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 has has in history? Do you ever recall something like that ever happening? Uh, Wait, it runs on banks. Um, well, there was there was a Russian uh, in Russia recently. People uh, there was like a mini run on a bank. What about Greece? Uh, when Greece's economy collapsed, was it there was similar? yeah there was run on banks there. Uh, so that's what it's called. Northern Rock. Do you remember Northern yes, Rock? There was lines outside, and and each of these situations, what happens is governments immediately step in and they're like, look, guys, don't worry, we're just gonna just give money away yeah. to calm everyone down because they know that if things go if if thing if that goes wrong then everything collapses yeah, yeah. because we don't have enough money in our society. So it's called run on banks. Yeah, but if that happens, they print out more money. Government doesn't that bring the doesn't that bring the the the, the worth of that respective currency down? Yeah. Okay. To some extent. Cool. Yeah. So let's carry on back to Musharraf. So, my M three and my dad. Yeah. Sure. Me. So now, um, the way that banks make money is they take money in cheap and they give that out at more and they keep a margin in the middle. That's that's basically how it works. Now with HSBC, mm -hmm. they can get that money from either their mm -hmm. millions of depositors completely mm -hmm. for free. Let's say mm -hmm. I'm with HSBC. Yeah. If I have two thousand pounds sat in my bank account, yeah. That's you know that's not you know the relationship in a current account is it's a on demand deposit. So you are actually lending that two thousand pounds to HSBC, mm -hmm. and every single time you you extract it out using your credit card, your debit card, HSBC is paying you back a portion of the loan that you have given them. Got you. That's what's actually happening here, and so HSBC can crack on and do what they like with that money. So HSBC have taken that money for free, and then they can just charge out, let's say one, two, three percent, what however many, however much they want to make. And um, and you know they've got some expenses, and then the rest is profit from them. That's it. Now the problem with savings of, with Arayan and Gatehouse and others is that they can't do that because they're not big enough to have as many current accounts. And also, I think it takes a lot more regulation, and you need a lot more branches and, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So instead, what they do is they go for savings accounts as their way of trying to get lots of money in. And so they say, look, we're that's gonna... why you can't take money out of their accounts without a three month notice. Exactly. Stuff like this. Yeah. yeah. Very stringent conditions to savings and current accounts. And that's also why these savings accounts are the highest in the market, even more than conventional banks, mm. because they are desperate for this money because they don't have any other sources of that money. Wow. So once you get that money in and you have to pay 2% on it back to the, you know, the non-Muslim yeah. uh, all owners of that money, yeah. you can't then give a, a diminishing Musharaka product out at 2% because you'd be at a loss. Of course, you have to So then it. you have to put it at 3% or more. And that's where, you know, the, 
that's where the higher return, that in, the higher rates come in, from. In your circles of conversations um, with people in this sector, is there a solution around this, bro? Um, because you're just going to... F- I, I mean, look, maybe I'm being a very childish, bratish kind of like... Like, oh, why can it not be six, seven hundred pound mortgage? What is it? But sh- have you have you spoken to people about how perhaps this they could not replenish but get access to more funds to not charge so so high and and their rent not to be so high and stuff like this? Is there a way around this? It's tough because look, the the two complaints that Islamic banks face is you you you're too expensive and you're not halal enough. Um, the not halal enough people say that you you need to be like pure shared ownership um, and that's what we want and the people who's too expensive say that you need to be cheaper now the way that you deal with the t- the expensive option is become become more haram. is become more haram right and the way that you deal All with right. the shared ownership okay. option is to become more expensive nicely exposed my dead eyes. <laughs> So, so you can't actually you can't actually solve both okay. of these problems because the solutions pull in opposite directions. Either you go, all right, look, we're going to go shared ownership, pure shared ownership. We're becoming like a full on landlord, no kind of underlying you know banking kind of economic savings accounts going on. We're going to charge you five percent. You would have a heart attack. I, I mean, would. you were having a heart attack at three percent. Yeah, I am. So, so you know that's not you, right? So then you can you know you can no longer. Uh, complain to them that you know it's not halal enough. Now the people who say that we want it, um, we want it to be cheaper. Mm. That you know you just you, you can't you can't go down that route without going for something like let's say borrowing off money of J P Morgan or a mainstream bank at a t- at a you know small marginal kind of interest rate and that lending it out. Technically, that is possibly Islamic actually because what happens in the back end where you get the money from. Is not actually relevant to the to, un- me, to, um, to the like pure kind of fiqhi analysis. Yeah. What what happens between you and me, me and the, me the bank and you, and where I get the money from? It's nothing to do. It's not strict. Like this is the halal or haram transaction. Yeah. This thing, you know, it, it is technically haram, but it's not as relevant to this. To, yeah. Okay. But of course, you know, we don't want to encourage that. But if you complain that this is too expensive, that is what you're encouraging, and so then. You have this. You have this group who is saying this is not ha- halal. You should be more halal. Them brothers need to calm down. Listen, if you man got <laughs> millions stacked up in your accounts and you guys want want to pay five percent, yeah, then maybe you need to be providing them banks with millions of pounds and maybe they can give it to me at two percent or something. I don't know, but okay, fine. Okay, I got there, you. There are potential like potential solutions. To like this. Um, the, f- I think the first of them is that we we need to be using Islamic banks and really like massing up that deposit you know the, the the free deposit money in an islamic bank like if an islamic bank has that free money sat there then they can reduce their rates quite considerably Ibrahim, you know how muslims are bro if i put if i put 10 grand in my account i can't be tell someone can't be telling me i can't touch it for three months no 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 so like you you so what i'm saying is if you have an islamic bank yeah. that you use as your current account okay cool so but there you know you know you can get your you money can, yes, you can. but then to do that arayan and gatehouse or others would need to become you know good as let's say um, HSBC GBC or, or NatWest Monzo or, or, or someone, yeah, yeah. which they're not. Yeah, um, so that, that's the problem there. Right. So, according to you, the position that you follow, and obviously besides yourself, our dear brother and our mutual friend Omar Suleiman is a dear brother of mine, and I take his advice and and and, and what he has to say and that of uh, various teachers and murabbis. Um Is Al Rayyan and its home purchase plan model? Is that still the most halal option to buy, to buy a property in in the UK? Well, the sad um, news is that Arayan is no longer really in the market. I know because uh, they stopped the HPP, haven't they? They've they've just pulled the plug. Okay. Um, on so, that. So what options are there? There's now basically just Gatehouse. Okay. Um, then then there's Stride Up, which is okay. another small smaller company. Then there's uh, and is it Way a, Home. And is it a similar model? Yeah, Stride Up is a similar model. Then you've got Way Home. You've got, um, you know, a much, much smaller level primary finance um, uh, at a relatively small level Halo Housing. And these guys are a bit more shared ownership. Okay. So there's no, like, kind of ficky concerns around them, okay. but they will charge you 5%. Um, yeah. And and actually, this, this, this point is really important. Like, why has Arayan gone out of the market? Partly it's because 
I mean, perhaps they couldn't be bothered and the Qataris pulled the plug. Or well, customers like me didn't invest in them enough. Yeah, and partly I think it's that. <laughs> partly I think it's that, you know, I'm sorry, us right. guys, the Muslim community, if a third of it is saying, you know, you guys are not halal, you know, jog on, then that's what they will do, right? And then what happens is you take out Ar-Rayan, let's say Gatehouse pulls the plug at this point, what we're left with is that Hanafi is, position of Dalai is Hard, the really? Hanafi position and HSBC, Barclays and NatWest are the, the net winners of that. Okay. And and so that's why I feel like, you know, criticism of Islamic banks and Islamic mortgages, whilst it should be done, should be done in a very careful way. We're already seeing the first, you know, fruits of that, which is now we're seeing exits from this market. Um, so let me ask you something. It's a tough one. Oh, no, no, I got you. And, and, and you know what? I guess some of the dramatics of the way I presented this specific subject is because of how close and how directly it affected me. Um, and I'm, on, I'm on the same. Like, I've gone for Gatehouse and yeah, Arayan for different so, family members. So, 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 so let me ask you this then, right? The, are you still of the position that if you can't afford it, don't buy it? Because that is kind of a general Islamic not rule, but it's like a principle. It's like a, it's a mindset. It's an Islamic mind. If you can't afford something, yani, what are you chasing to have it for? Yeah. Is that still kind of, like if you can't put a deposit down and sustain the monthly payments, why are you looking to buy a house? Are you still of that position? Um, would you be of that position? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so. Um, well, but if, I, if, if there's a necessity to buy a house, let's say you've got a disabled child and you kind of need to move out rental accommodation then sure the darura argument could be used to get a conventional mortgage perhaps because you don't qualify for an islamic one can the darura argument be applied to those who just say look if i carry on renting i'm not gonna have any savings i have nothing left for my children i don't know about that um because my view is is that if you start with the principle of islamic mortgages are halal then my view is that that's what you should build yourself up to it's not like it's impossible to buy a house. Mm. It's just a bit more expensive. Yeah, it's the same deposit, right? Five or ten. Of course, or 20 but the monthlies are more. But the monthlies are more. But due to the living standards and the cost of living standards in the UK and the huge disparity between what people are earning and receiving on average and what mm. it's costing, especially with the hikes, ridiculous hikes in diesel, petrol, and gas and electric and so forth. Yeah. I, I can't help but people wondering. Of course, those that extra three, four, five, six hundred pound matters. Um, I hear you on that and, and I would say you know, Talk to a scholar Get a particular fatwa If you are in that circumstance Because uh, you know, Making the darura argument From a self Kind of you know, your, Yourself From a biased perspective Is quite you It's know, dangerous It's dangerous It is dangerous 100%. But get a scholar's on, uh, perspective on it Most of them will say No don't do it Okay So before we move on from this um, Let's talk about Very briefly The Hanafi position the Hanafi position, and this was something that our fathers and grandfathers, they received from South Africa and other places back in the mm. 80s and 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and that was that in the land of the non-Muslims, Darul Harb, from a fiqhi point of view, not from a literal land of yeah, war, yeah, but, yeah. but from, so you need to do it, bro. We're regulated by impressed. We have to put these little disclaimers. I'll say literally, we'll think, we think this place is a land of war. But anyway, if in the land of the non-Muslims, where you are living as a Muslim minority, you're allowed to uh, own one house and engage in corrupt contracts that may involve riba. I'm not sure if it's the receiving the riba or giving the riba, but the position is that yeah, yeah. in Darul Harb, you're allowed one house on interest for residential purposes. Have you looked into this position? Yeah, so this is the famous uh, fatwa by Sheikh Gardawi yeah. uh, back in the day. And why is it uh, then? Why is it then widely seen as a Hanafi position? If I don't know if Yusuf Qardawi is um, a Hanafi, I don't know actually. I think I think he possibly might be Hanafi. I don't know. Um, and I think a lot of Hanafis, honestly, I think these days are you know on the Islamic mortgage end mm. of the spectrum as well. So like, I feel like you know it's not necessarily a Hanafi position anymore. It's kind of yeah, a bit yeah, more complicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the the opinion is uh, was a valid one back mm. in the day. Um, the the key, the crux of the argument today is do you think islamic mortgages are a permissible alternative and also do you think shared ownership options are a permissible alternative if you have these halal alternatives um then you know to say that you can go for the haram is is just not viable anymore but those guys you know sheikh Kardari, Kardawi when he was opining on it these alternatives didn't exist at all. So you're saying having those options now makes that position very 
doubtful and problematic untenable, and untenable. untenable in my view um and uh, and I, I actually think even um scholars who would um say that you know uh, the um a conventional mortgage is is fine because we think that islamic mortgages are basically the same as conventional so you might as well go for the cheaper option mm. so people like you know my teacher sheikh akram would say say that i think actually with this rise of shared ownership options that are quite viable they may well you know actually have a different perspective on it um if they were to dig into it perhaps i should you know i should reach out and have a chat on that actually be interesting to find out did you say sheikh akram's of that position okay uh, car insurance claims so I've, I've, you know, you pay a monthly or you pay a, a yeah. yearly thing, and you've been in an accident, little, little whiplash and that, and like you know, this you can make two thousand pounds there or something yeah. for a little claim there, haram. Uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, it's uh, you're you're allowed to, if if you're if it's a fraud. No, not yeah. for like genuine, yeah. no, genuine claim. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Of course not. Yeah. Like for, I'm talking about you've genuinely been in an accident. Yeah. You, your back's hurting, and you're entitled to some compensation. Yeah. And to claim of that, any problems with that? Uh, I don't think so. No. So that um, with especially with car insurance and certain kinds of insurance, the scholars say that you have to get it because so, it's the law of the land. Because so so that's fine. And then you know you whatever follows from that is fine. I'm personally this is like one of those you know posi- very small number of positions where I'm of the minority view, which is which is that I think that insurance is generally permissible in lots of instances because um, others would, because others would deem it to be a form of gambling, right? Yeah, or, others a, ga- or, or, or a gambling uh, element. They they, they 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 run multiple arguments. They say it could be gambling. They say that it's interest. Uh, they say that there's gharar involved. So they they throw they throw all three. Of what, the is, what is gharar for? Gharar is uncertainty. Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah. So yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, uh, and and I. Um, um, you know, humbly of the view that yeah. I kind of incline towards a different position. Um, but, you know, I want to like clearly state that this is a minority position and, you know, you don't, you shouldn't necessarily follow me. Um, but a lot of scholars, and I won't name them, mm. um, you know, relatively prominent ones as well have um, similar views on okay. that. Um so so yeah, so I can analyze it, and I'll I'll take my personal hat off okay. and just analyze it from the majority hat. They would all say that it's fine to claim off insurance as well because it's um, it's a darura. So like you know, if you've got a car insurance contract that you've entered into, what follows from that is you know it of, is what it is. Of course, brothers and mainly, but sisters as well. It is caveat to you being honest, mm. right? So if you did honestly injure yourself and your car's damage in an accident is genuinely three thousand pounds and not a hyped up invoice by a thousand pounds that should be okay right yeah we're not talking about those who are actually actively being crooked and, and lying um last one before uh we go into muslim charities ramadan and bring that podcast to a close um car finance right <laughs> a personal favorite of of many people Right, you're you're into cars yourself, aren't you? I am, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, I buy and sell cars, but we don't offer finance. Right, okay. Um, is finance permissible? PCP, HP, direct finance from BMW or third party finance. Let's start with, let's start with high purchase finance. If I've gone to buy a £25,000 Mercedes C63 AMG S for 25 grand, if you get that, that's a bargain. Um, and you know you've put similarly a deposit down. Yeah, you've taken out a sixty-month uh, agreement on a fixed APR of seven point nine percent. Problematic, haram, permissible. What, what's your position? That of your teachers? What what have you yeah. heard or listened? So um, let me caveat this by um, you know this is not like a fatwa or anything. No, of course not. Um, I, I I'm literally asking yeah. your thoughts and views. Yeah. So we did we did an article on this. We did some research. I talked to a few different scholars around this as well, um, and they sh- they shared this view that actually, if you look at PCP, PCH, and HP contracts, um, the reality is even though it says APR, what is actually happening is that you are buying a stake in the car, and then you are renting the you know the car from the from the indiv- uh, from the company the finance company and then ultimately you are either returning the car 
or you're buying the you know the, the full amount. That sounds a bit like uh, the uh, the Islamic finance HPP model. Yeah, exactly. So okay. that's why actually in in principle it might be that all of these things are perfectly permissible. Um, but the devil is in the detail here okay. because there's so many different types of contracts and financing agreements and what have you out there. So what um, could, what what could be the differences the the the, 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 the semantic or intricate difference that could make it hold on? Um, so the first and the, the most th- important thing is where does the ownership lie um, between you and the in and the? Can and I the, give you an example then? Yeah, I've gone and bought a BMW M3. I've gone and bought it from a car trader. The car trader's all he's really basically done is he he's basically put me in touch with Close Brothers or Motonova or yeah, these guys. Yeah, yeah. Close Brothers or Motonova, I've paid them the deposit, they pay the rest. They say, right, Diddy, five years, sixty months, seven point nine percent fixed APR, boom. Um, you feel you fail to make the payments once, twice, we're taking that car back. Uh, and then if there's any equity in it, we'll give it to you back. If there's any negative equity, you have to pay us. That's how it works. Yeah. So there, if you look at the contract, Close Brothers or the lending company they own the car. will be the owners of the car. Yes. That's good, right? Because that is actually, you know, the, the, the how do you understand your payments back to them? Mm. What is going on there? Mm. Because they own that car, that is best construed as rent. Um, in you know my kind of humble analysis, mm. and and as a result of that, everything that follows is is fine. Um, however, if there's any ambiguity about who owns it, and that is actually now shifting to you, and and you are on the hook for the loan, independent of the car, because you notice in this analysis, they take the car off you, they sell it, yes, they get the money, and then they pay you back, hundred percent. That's all cool. But if there was a situation where you were kind of still on the hook. And it didn't really matter about the car, um, and you still had to pay that loan back. You know, it's really just a loan between and you and the car. Then, then that would become problematic. Yeah. Because then you would own the car, but then you're still on the hook for the loan, which is just a money on money transaction. That would be not permissible. Okay. Um, but usually, what is going on is actually it's all based on the car. So that um, scenario that I've just given you, which is perhaps the most common yeah. scenario, that you deem or understand to be permissible. Very tentatively. I don't want people to go mental and like just you know. No, no, of course. Um, what uh, about what about car traders giving out finance? What about uh, a second-hand car trader who has agreements with Motonovo, Close Brothers, Santander, and in fact a large portion of their income is based on selling cars and finance. Yeah. Similar thing. Yeah, because if the, if you're if it's a contract that's permissible, and you're making some kind of. Uh, agency fee or something on the back of something permissible, then that's fine. Now, let me kind of caveat all of this yep. with I, I want I'm having a chat with I think after Ramadan some car finance company that have reached out um, to you know try and explore something in a lot more detail because it ultimately comes down to the contract how Absolutely. it's structured 100%. and you know there's things there's nuances here like late payment fees and how that's handled course, yep. and you know what ha- happens in a case of default what what about how the credit consumer act and ha- how that has a you know interplay with with the contract mm. there's a few different nuances here of course um, but at a really high level like all of the jigsaw puzzle pieces are there for it to be permissible it's just depends on how it's kind of put together. Devil in the detail kind of yeah, thing, yeah? Yeah. Um, is all interest riba? Because we, no. we see interest practically written in nearly so many financial transactions, contractual yeah. transactions. It's just a term that we see everywhere in the West, right? Yeah. Is all, form, is all forms and types of interest regarded as a riba from a shari'i point of view? No. Okay, so give me an example, give our viewers and listeners an example of a type of interest which is not regarded as a riba. Would it be that APR to yeah, do? Yeah, for, exam- for example, and any kind of higher purchase type of transaction, lots of people hire industrial kind of machinery and what have you, mm. is really just, you know, just hiring it. Mm. But often the people who are involved in it, are, it's a company like Investec or mm. you know, fi- like some kind of finance company, and they're just all set up to be using words like APR and interest. And from their perspective, it's a financing agreement. They just happen to have, you know, an asset and it really is rent. Okay. But they'll set up the, the paperwork and everything to refer to it as interest and APR. But that but being referred to as that does not make it a riba. Okay. Uh, riba is something slightly separate. 
Okay, give me a type of interest, an example that is riba. Uh, a conventional loan. Um, so you go to a payday you know, lender mm. and you get a loan out and then you have to pay more than that loan back. Or credit cards mm. would be just a conventional loan. Um, or M- Basically uh, making money off money. Overdraft, yeah. And all of these things are just money off money. There's no money asset money. involved. Okay, cool. Um, I can't believe I forgot to do this one, but I think this is quite important for young students, especially Aki, who usually co-hosts the program, right. my little brother. He did his physiotherapy degree in Bradford University without taking a student loan out. Wow. The family supported him. I, I took a student loan out. Yeah. But I never got a job over 15 grand to pay them back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what? <laughs> <laughs> student loans. Where do you see on student loans? Uh, we've done this big campaign on alternative student finance. Okay. But we want the government to introduce a halal version of student loans. So that probably should indicate okay. my perspective. Okay, cool. Um, my, my view is that, you know, if the... Uh, if it's absolute necessity, then, you know, you kind of take the necessity card and go yeah. for it. Uh, if you can afford not to, that's great as well. Um, I know that there are some arguments out there, and I'm somewhat sympathetic to those arguments, particularly now with the, some of the changes to student finance that say that actually, you know, it's just linked to inflation. It's no longer interest. It can be seen as a graduate tax. I have sympathies for that view. But I think the reality is more of a pragmatic one, which is, you know, we did a poll with our, you know, very unscientific poll on Telegram. Uh, it to, to just like, you know, find out from our audience what their views are. What do they come out with? And over 50% are still very concerned about this. They oh. w- wouldn't want to go for a student, like student finance as it is. Mm. So it doesn't matter what my view or anyone's view is. If, if it's going to stop the majority of Muslims going to university or cause any kind of impediment to that, then that needs to be resolved. Absolutely. So we should we should continue campaigning. Okay. Um, bringing the podcast to a close. I, I have to say this to you, by the way. I know it's really random. You have such a soothing ambience about you. <laughs> Honestly. Well, I hope my wife is listening to no, this. No, I'm being serious. You are one of the most calming, soothing guests I've had in 73, 74 episodes. May Allah bless you, bro. Um, I mean, bring the podcast to a close. This episode will be released in Ramadan, inshallah. But if it isn't, what we're about to discuss still matters. Roshan forwarded me an email today from Islamic Finance Guru, where basically you're clarting, man, saying, let's do charity right this Ramadan. And then you basically gave, imagine if I gave you 150 million pounds of the Ummah's money and said, invest it sensibly, please. You then went ahead and gave it to five pillars and I was joking and invested that based on whichever <laughs> option popped up in front of you most, whichever option moved you emotionally. That would be bonkers, right? So basically what you've done is you've looked at 20 impactful charities, right? What made you do this? Uh, what made me do this? What made IFG launch this campaign? Um, so what made us do this is because I just really quite feel quite strongly in our community putting the money in the right things. And there's two big pots of money in our community. One is investments and the other is charity. And if and that's probably the bigger pot. Charity is the big money. And big money. And so if, if you're getting if if that, if that pot yeah. is being allocated badly, mm. then that just screws up everything. Khalas, you're uh, talking to five pillars here. We all we have a fantastic relationship with Muslim charities. It's a Marmite relationship. <laughs> Everyone's our friends and to be sticky on them. So let's so let's talk about this then, yeah? A charity who invests lots of money in social media advertising to ensure their advert gets to your news feed to emotionally compel you to make a donation. Do you find hmm. that problematic? I don't find that in itself so problematic. What, so what do you find problematic? Then? What I find problematic is that um, we as a community will give in to that charity's appeal. That's what I find problematic. But that's because giving sadaqah for many people is an emotional thing, bro. Exactly. So what I'm saying is that you keep the emotion, but start th- start switching on that rational mind as well. Okay. Because sure, it's it's true that you know we give emotionally. That's great, but don't just give emotionally. Because if if you're going to do that, then what is the net result of what's happening? As I said, is 150 million pounds. That's a lot of money. That is. Is going to be deployed to people who are ultimately. Um, you know, they're really good at emotional appeals and they're really good at social media marketing. But is that a really good criteria for where charity should be going? I don't think so. 
And the only way that changes is a few different ways. So the first is, I think charities need to like step up and be a bit more responsible. But honestly, it's not, I don't think it's their primary responsibility. I think it's ours. And it's about raising awareness of actually, you know, the difference between a hundred pounds donated to a charity and a hundred pounds to an impactful charity we think that it might be a difference of, let's say, you know, uh, two, three, five pounds, right? It ultimately, it's all going to do good. But actually, the data shows that it's sometimes up to 700, 1,000 X return or 1,000 X difference in an impactful versus non-impactful charity. And from our perspective, when they turn up, it's the same ad, it's the same event, it's the same speech. And, and it's very difficult for us to take it, to tell it apart. And so ultimately, we just go with whoever pops up the most. Give me an example of an impactful charity. I mean, I'm trying to access a list of 20. Yeah. How come I can't access Are you going to charge me to access the 20? No, no. You okay. just click on read more, I think. Okay. Or download. So you can see so it. So I'm here now. Yeah, go down, go down, go down. Go yeah, down. Yeah, there, there. The Ramazan Charity Guide. Uh, yeah, go up. There, download now. Download now. Yeah, there we go. So this year... What we've done is some is like a really light version of where I would like us to go over the next mm -hmm. few years. This year, I haven't like we haven't really gone into each charity and say, look, can you tell us per project what impact you've actually had? And by impact, I mean quality of life improved and the life expectancy improved. Mm -hmm. like, we haven't done that, right? And I don't think any charity would give us that data. And uh, I don't think any charity has that data. Yeah. Um, so there's no point doing it. But what I want us to do is, you know, this is the first baby step where we, rather than just giving... Easy five pillars made it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> We're like second bottom to the list. I hope that's not like order of favoritism, bro. No, definitely not. Okay, okay Slam 21 he came after, so you don't mind like 20th. So we've got here, so we've got some dots here. And um, sorry, bro, because I, I wanted to read this today before yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm no thinking. So we've got... Islamic Relief, they tick all boxes. They're one of the biggest charities, right? Of course. Muslim and Muslim hands, they tick all the boxes except for purifying wealth. And this is not this is not like a, that that bot that page mm. is not like a good, 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 good. No, 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 That's just, just the case of like these are the things that they offer, like Gurbani and Come on. You've got, you got Islamic Relief, Muslim Hands, Muslim Charity, NZF. Umar Welfare Trust, Muslim Aid, Zara Trust, Cage, Common Cage, CMC, Eden Care in UK, Muslim Burial Fund, Solace, Hugs, Mend, Ramadan 10, MCB, Muslim Youth Helpline, MCB. Some of these people didn't even engage with us. Yeah. <laughs> we still covered them yeah, because yeah. You know, no, it's the no, right thing to no, do. Of course, of course. MRDF, Common, Falsis, 5 Pills, Sun Trinity, MashaAllah. So we fall under Sadaqa and local work. Yeah. Sakhal Khair, bro. No, well, yeah, come on. So yeah. I mean, it's not really. Yeah, I guess. Enough I, for that, bro. Yeah. So, what kind of what kind of things do you not want Muslims to be doing this Ramadan? What um, when it uh, comes to giving? When it comes to giving, because Ibrahim, they're, they're gonna have the prominent fundraisers crying. I'm sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. in a serious, meaningful way that they mean it. But they're gonna be crying. Mm. They're gonna cite all those hadiths about the orphans and the widows. They're gonna yeah, describe yeah, yeah. the plights. We're gonna see a crying widow, a starving child. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same thing. Five pillars are gonna be on the scene talking about right. The ummah's finished if you don't support us. Yeah, you, it's gonna be the same emotional pull strings. What do you not want the Muslim donors doing this Ramadan? I don't think emotions is a bad thing, by the way. Like, we, we are humans and, you know, we will respond to emotion. But what I would like us to do, I will, let's say my personal, how I will approach it. I guess what I said about um, the emotions is that the emo when you see an emotional ad or an mm. emotional appeal, um, appeal, that makes you not think think strategically. Exactly. That's, that, that's the point I'm trying to make. Exactly. There's not, I agree with you, there's nothing wrong with emotions is needed. Yeah. You need to rally the Ummah, to rally the Muslim it to, for a good cause. It gets the money out. It gets the money out. Yeah, yeah exactly. But I'm saying that sometimes that, that bli the emotion blinds you to think strategically. Exactly. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. Exactly. Go on. Um, so the way I probably approach it for my own like zakat and sadaqah sadaq this Ramadan is I'll, um, you know, obviously use our zakat calculator. No admin fees, by the way. It's literally just all goes to them. But, um, and so rationally, I would have given most of my charity to some one of the four portfolios in there. Mm -hmm. I personally would probably give most of it to the impactful strategic NGOs because I feel like that's the most neglected area. Yep. Um, and, um, and and so that I know that I've done the rational bit. Now, if I turn up to, you know, uh, an event and someone, you know, does does a pitch and, you know, I'm kind of, 
emotionally moved I want to give something Great You know Or I want to give to my local masjid I want to give to this that and the other That's all cool And you should do that But at least I know that I've done my intellectual oh, bit But you know what bro I've, I've got, done that I've got you bro Basically what you're, te- what you're saying is You're telling Muslims To just be more Be strategic And, and far thinking Of how you give Exactly Because there's a vicious cycle here If you don't do that right Because Five Pillars Is a tiny organisation It is It's not comparatively to Comparatively to the charities Yes Exactly like you, I've not seen a Five Pillars ad On, on the TFL rail Ever Right, but I've been seeing those for the, some of the larger charities for months, and what that is going to do is more people are going to donate to them, and that means that they're now incentivized to do that further. So the best people who win at that game of social media do that more, better next time, and they win even more. And the smaller the charity is, they just get you know crowded out, crowded out, crowded mm-hmm. out, and the net result is this, this vicious cycle where ninety five percent of the money then starts going to these causes. Where the people are winners at social media But that's not a criteria for where our ummah's wealth should 100%. be deployed Shall I give you a crazy example? One time I was sitting with my mum May Allah give her, bless her a long life, I mean I love her I to mean. miss my mum um, We sat there watching Channel S And there was a, an appeal for Rohingya And she, she said to me, she goes uh, Dilwar, put a donation on, 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 my, on my behalf Yeah? Uh, give a donation on my behalf uh, And I asked my mum I said mum You do know the work That your son does What does he do? Yeah She goes you're a shambadik Shambadik basically means You're a journalist Yeah right. I was like okay But what kind of work do I do? She goes you know You cover Muslim stories And Muslim causes And stuff like this Yeah My mum bless her And you come on TV And you debate people And stuff like this I said okay I goes mum you know, with the knowledge that you have right now about what I do, how much of this twenty pound would you give to my work? She goes, none. Wow. Yeah. I goes, why is that? She goes, because they're starving. They're starving. They're they're mm-hmm. gonna die if if I don't give them a food pack. If I don't support this orphan, it's gonna have a, an immediate direct effect. And by me helping them, is there at least short term will beat a gratification, a solution to their hunger tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Then I explained to her the strategic element of the work Muslim representation in the media Changing the narratives Protecting normative Islamic beliefs and values I'm a shaykh, a ulama, a dua, a institution From the attacks of the media The mainstream western media The war propaganda machine Is a multi-trillion dollar industry We are barely hitting six, seven figures mom Right? And this is why we need to Defend the Muslims from a media perspective Because media is everything The Prophet Sallam at a time when the poets were against him Of Quraysh, of the pagans, they should attack him When he was in a position of strength He, alloc- he allocated his own poets to counter them Mom, how much of that £20 would you give me now? She goes, maybe a couple of pounds And that's all I wanted And I guess that's kind of what we're asking the Ummah to somewhat do, right? Exactly Just strategically exactly. give Exactly And... Um, and look, I'm not holding our, our charity guide or us as the ultimate arbiters or the people who have the right kind of mm. allocation. It's just our thoughts, right? Yeah, and it's guidance. What, what, I want to, what, what I want people to do is take that research and then run with it and do their own thing. Mm. But um, if, you know, those starving children, we want to help them, not just now, but we want to end that starvation in 10 years' time or 20 years' time. And if you just keep on giving them all 100% Donations of uh, to emergency appeals, then there's nothing left to you know to support the work that will end that stuff in twenty years time, and and so that's why you know I think it's really important. Like that's basically the reason why we're doing it. Ibrahim, it was an absolute pleasure having you on, bro. And I'm looking dead into your eyes, and I'm telling you, I've benefited so much from today's discussion. No, 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 honestly, Barakallah for coming on, bro. I know there's going to be lots of views and listeners who's going to tune into many Shabab youngsters, many of the Instagram folk be like, raw, okay, that shatters our side hustles one time. <laughs> We should do side hustles. I'm a big believer in side hustles and entrepreneurship. Yeah, but there's a particular kind of side hustle that goes against any yeah, yeah, Come yeah. on. <laughs> but anyway, Ibrahim, it was, a, it was an absolute pleasure having you on, bro. Brothers and sisters, please check out islamicfinanceguru.com. Um, I'm going to be honest to you, um, I came late onto rating Ibrahim. Right? And that's mainly to do with the fact that I didn't know the brother personally. Uh, Rosham was uh, you know, singing your praises time ago. He genuinely was. And um, I was truly honoured and pleasured to have you on, bro. I've, oh, exactly. I've, I've, I've learned so much from you And I think your humility And your soothingness Was, was, was very it was, Made this conversation uh, Very easy to have May Allah bless you bro 
No, I mean, Allah I mean. Brothers and sisters, please remember to subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel and of course the avid listeners. You can find us on all the podcast uh, audio platforms, Spotify, Google, Apple and everything else. And until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Blood Brothers Podcast, a five-pillars production.